hopefully they're going to develop other plants. But as I understand it, they actually have to have somebody there in the factory driving these screws in at an angle, which seems like a really tedious kind of job. Yeah, so. if you ever hear me complain about my job, just remind me I could be doing <laughs> right. that for eight or nine hours a day. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor Mike Gurton. Hi. Fine Home Building Technical Editor Mark Peterson. Hello. Fine Home Building Senior Editor Jeff Rose. Howdy. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to see you guys. Thanks for being here this morning. Yeah, yeah. good to be here. Mike, I can't wait another minute to talk about, you were burning boards uh, as a test. Can you talk about that? Boy, I had as, almost as much fun doing this as I did with the uh, drywall hopper a few months ago. You know, <laughs> get a new... Get a tool out and you try something new. So um, I've been working on my house plans for my future house. Actually, my wife has been holding my feet down to the fire and, and, and you know, saying, look at this. I want you to, you know, look at this arrangement of layout for the guest rooms and things. And anyway, it got me thinking about the siding. Um, she wants to use, she saw, uh, you know, a, uh, a show sugi ban, or otherwise known as yaki sugi uh, type of siding, which is charred wood, where they char usually cedar. It's a Japanese process, and um, they use either heat or flame to char it, and it gives you a much more durable, long-lasting siding because the, the the carbon on the outside protects the wood fibers on the inside um, from rot and bugs and so on. So it protects watched, better than paint. But well, I, <laughs> this is the I thing I've know. always, yeah, okay. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll have to look into that a little more, but more it was getting the, the look that my wife wanted. So of course it's, I looked at it a couple of years ago at a manufacturer out of Japan that ships it to the U S uh, for the siding and it's very expensive, you know, like, <laughs> yes, <it> like is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. you, you looked into it, Mark. Yeah. 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 It's like, like well, how expensive? Either, like yeah. 10 bucks a square foot or yeah. 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 Eight, yeah. Eight to 10 or even more, depending on the, the, how you want it to look and the, how deep the, the charring is and what finishes they put on top of it. So I figured it, they're just cooking it. I mean, they're just flaming it over. So I looked at a few YouTube videos and went to town. I had a, already had a propane torch which is just a, a long, like, half-inch diameter pipe or three-inch diameter pipe with a cone at the end that you run a hook to a propane tank, and it throws out, sounds like a jet engine yeah. when it's running. It sounds and, like a hot uh, air balloon, if you've ever heard one of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It does sound <laughs> like the uh, – that's just a bigger version of this. And I took some pieces of, of pine that I had, uh, locally cut, rough-cut pine, uh, one by 12, I think, and I just – torched it and boy it goes quick and it's really <laughs> and I, I was af of course you're afraid the first time you do this that you're gonna create a, a fire hazard you know in your backyard but really the wood chars rather than than burning um you know it doesn't um the flame doesn't continue burning so how most. how long do you have to hold it to the surface uh for example you know, it all depends on the appearance you want. If you go really light, it looks like, uh, you know, a light brown toasted color. Um, I went a little longer till it got to like an alligator uh, mm -hmm. sort of look with the charring. And that was really seconds. I did, a, I think, about a six foot long board. And it took me about a, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes to do the whole board. Um, then I took I'm the board it's... and... Um, so I'm guessing it's so expensive because this is labor intensive, right? Someone yeah. has to, to do this. Uh, unlike, you know, paint and siding goes through a machine and comes out yeah. the other end. Perfect, right? But well, they probably have a machine. Yeah, I, well, I guarantee yeah. they have a machine, yeah. But for, for somebody who's doing it themselves, you know, and you're, you're, you, you value your time in a different way. For me, this would be fun to do. It would be fun, yeah. You know, maybe so, so uh, – 
Are I you doing this just to get the look that you want? Or are you actually doing a, I mean, are you going to do it like a weatherized test to see how it holds up? Or what would you cover this? I mean, would you coat it in a clear coat afterwards? What do you think? Of well, so, so that was part of this weekend's project was, um, one, I wanted to see if it would work with pine, which everything I read said, yeah, sure. Because the other product is cedar. And, you know, cedars, Western red cedar is pretty, actually very expensive right now. So I, I'm always looking for ways to cut costs. So it was to see if pine would work, and it does, and then to try different uh, finishes on it. And I put on like a, a just a like a Thompson's sealer kind of material, mm -hmm. and then I tried a couple of different um, thinnings of linseed oil, and then I tried another. I had some leftover uh, stain product, like a clear stain from a job years ago. So I put it on the board and I left it out in the rain that we had over oh, the last couple of days. And uh, interesting the way you, you know, you lock in that carbon and, with the sealer and you run your hand along it and, you know, no, hmm. no black. I just what ran my hand on it a little while ago. What about the smell? The smell of the finish or the smell of the carbon? Does it smell like burnt wood? Uh, I didn't notice it, I, but I didn't, you know, I don't smell as good as I used to in a couple of different ways. But um, Yeah, if yeah you, that's actually a good point. If you were thinking about doing this inside, so this, I mean, we're talking siding here, right? Exterior, exactly, yeah. So that's not a big deal as far as smell, but I don't know if you've ever worked on a house that had a fire issue inside. Mm. The smell of smoke is really terrible. hard to get rid yeah, of. Yeah, terrible. It is. I, I grew up in a house where we burn firewood for heating, and uh, yeah, it, it, it never goes away year-round. It, it comes up. So I did it, you know, just to see if it can be done, and just, I'll, I'll leave these pieces out for a few months just to see what happens with the finish. But I wanted to get a, you know, a jump start on this uh, to to give it some time to, you know, think through it, and then of course make sure my wife's going to give me the thumbs up when it comes time to use this <laughs> versus the eight to twelve dollar a square foot off. I was wondering, I was wondering how that works. So it's the carbon. I guess that makes sense. So really you're, you're getting rid of everything but the carbon when you burn it so that it had that carbon is what's the protective shell on the exterior of it. That's huh. what I understand. And, you know, cause otherwise you've got the, if you leave wood exposed, the UV light's going to deteriorate the lignans. So here you've, you've given it that carbon black shield. Hmm. And, I went to, a, it, I went, oh, go ahead. And it looks cool, you know. It, 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 it has does a look cool. Nice yeah. look. I went to a. I visited a cooperage, uh, where they make whiskey barrels about a month ago. So they do the same thing. They have the, you know, we went. It was a plant tour, so we walked through and saw that I did it. And they roll these big barrels over a just a big torch, like you said. And and each, you know, bourbon manufacturer has a different specification. You know, it's either a <laughs> twenty second burn or a thirty second burn, and there's ratings for it in the. And the, you can see how, the, you know, you can make it really look like alligator, pretty rough, you know, rough looking. But yeah, do they go to that level or do they just give it a light color, light? No, nope. light brown? they their strict their heaviest burn is like a 30 second burn and it is a total alligator burn. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Does that make good hooch, Mark? It's all, it's all good, Hoosh Patrick. <laughs> well, being in, being in Kentucky, I mean, you're in the heartland. Yeah. Of, yeah. Of, what else are you yeah. going to do, right? Uh, right. There's, there's, I, think, I, think, I think it's three to one. I think there's three whiskey barrels for every person in this state. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you, we, were, we toured a Jim, uh, plant and Jim Beam had just lost a, a Rick house, and I think they lost 40 in, to, fi to fire. And they'd lost 40,000 barrels. And I thought, and I asked the tour guide, we were touring the plant, and I said, is that going to you know, affect production? And they go, nah, we got 4 million other ones sitting around. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea it was such big business. Holy cow. Oh, it's huge. I, uh, try not to, and I try not to support them too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, uh, did you consider Shoshugi Bond for siding your house when you were building you know, it? Not for my house, but you know, I it's but I've I've been fascinated by that process, and I would love to do a little shed or a wishing well or something like that for sure. Just because then, if it does fail in ten years, it's not quite as big a deal. <laughs> but you know, the look. Speaking of whiskey, back to whiskey again. 
in Kentucky again. I, everything goes back to whiskey. So, oh no, this is actually tobacco. So I, I'm build. I still <laughs> haven't built my shop. So whiskey and tobacco. Uh, and down here, all these barns out here are, are old tobacco barns, and they're all black, so they could heat up. And they don't. What they do is they just run vertical you know, purlins or whatever, and then they slap the siding on and they leave gaps in between it. So, you know, in a hundred years ago, and they didn't even bother, they just, you know, they would have nine foot boards, whatever, and they would slap a row on and then the, the row above it, they would just slap right over the row below it. So, and it would, and the board would kind of curl out where the two over went because they wouldn't, you know, and I just love that look. Mm. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that on my shop without having a monstrous painting slash insect slash rotting nightmare. So I haven't, I haven't quite figured that out, but what's the but traditional do something way to deal with it, Mark? Do they put, I've heard of used motor oil commonly used to protect buildings like that. Is that what they did? Yeah. <clears throat> no, they had paint back then, but it was farmers. A lot of times did their fencing was used motor oil for sure. But there's a, there's a paint called Kentucky black and it's all kind of a flat black and all the fences and all the barns around here are all this the flat black. It seems like with a sprayer, that wouldn't be a big deal to uh, maintain or put on there, you know? No, <clears throat> no. But the problem is insects. If I do it to where, if I like do like a T T111 behind it and then just put boards so it looks like there's space behind there, there's just so many crevices for water to get in and bugs to get in. So it might not be a realistic plan, but I'm looking to do it. Well, that's, I mean, I love vernacular architecture and I think that's a uh, perfect application of, you know, you, you, you want this building, why not make it look like it's been there, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't, Jeff, you've been, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, doesn't, I think Benjamin Obdike have a black WRB? Yeah, so. they do. And they have all the flashing tapes and all that. So you, you're like going to do an open joint. Uh, uh, That's yeah. the thing. And I don't know if a WRB can handle that exposure or, or what, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. Well, I'm sure someone from Benjamin Obdike is going to call and offer <laughs> help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got a warehouse full of this black WRB. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, you've been busy. Uh, your, your railing looks amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's coming along. So are those sleeves that uh, go over the posts, am I right? How's that work? Uh, no, the, the, the posts are just the cedar posts that have been uh, stained to match the, the um, composite decking. Looks great. Yeah. Are you yeah, closing in on it? Pardon me? Are you closing in on it? Are you ready to put the cables in? Yep. Uh, they're, it, yeah, it's imminent. <laughs> are you looking forward to it? I mean, like... Uh, I always worry about things I've never done before. I'm guessing you haven't attempted this. Uh, no, I'm not not concerned about um, installing the the cable. That's kind of almost like the the least of it at this point. I think. I mean, yeah, you've done the did hard you part. Get, yeah. Did you get the threading needle to push the? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I learned the hard way. If you take the cut off stainless steel cable because it's a wound cable, and you try to push it through a hole that you've drilled in wood posts, <laughs> I can guess they, what happens. The, little, the, 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 the threads snag right. on the edge, yeah. Yeah. and then they have the, those needles that you just kind of put. It's like a little cap, but it's long, and you slip it over, and boy, they just shoot right through. Yeah. My, uh, we, I, I've only done cable a few times, and you know, if you do the ball test, what is it, a six-inch ball that's not supposed to fit through the yeah, each cable? Inch, yeah. You really are four-inch. Yeah, you really have to tighten those cables, <laughs> and I'm just concerned. I mean, that's just the force on that's just got to be immense, and I'm always worried that it's going to pull the posts together. You know, even if you have it braced on top, it's going to somehow or pull the corner in or something. But especially I mean, at the top, right? I mean, you, you got a lot of leverage uh, if you're making that 100, uh, you know, pounds of tension or whatever it's supposed to be. It's a lot of tension. Yeah, there's there are tension gauges, and that's why I think Mark they they. Most of the cable rail companies all specify about a three-inch maximum spacing between those cables. Yes, so you don't that, have to, yeah. Yeah, and then, then that tension doesn't have to be quite as, as, yeah. as in, you know, strong as, uh, as you'd need if you spaced it at <laughs> right. three and three. three, and three yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah and, then you're, yeah. And then, the, then there's um, spacers in, in between the posts to help keep that spread minimized. 
Yeah, that's right. That's so right. it's like a bar, Jeff, that connects yeah. the, the yeah. yeah. In, in my case, I just use more two by fours um, between the, the posts. Just yep. And they're they're spec for like three feet apart, so there's not a whole lot of cable that's not supported. Sure. So your four by fours now look like the guard posts look like they're about six feet apart. Uh, they, uh, along the, they, the main lo length of the deck, they're about eight feet, just under eight, eight feet, feet apart. Part, yeah. So then you'll put a, a separate two by four that'll so be yeah, spacer. Yeah, there'll, there'll be actually two between each eight Three. foot yeah. section. Oh, that'll break it up. Uh, the podcast listeners are going to be psyched to hear this is moving along with some uh, rapidity after this point, right? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> well, very soon it'll be done. <laughs> From Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I had an uh, interesting experience this past weekend. We had a, a neighborhood yard sale, and I sold some of my old friends. Uh, uh, do you guys remember those flywheel DeWalt finish nailers? The woo-doo, <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I sold a 16 gauge model and uh, the, the gentleman who bought it was super psyched to have it uh, kind of clumsy tool kind of heavy but super reliable I think anyone who's had one would agree I sold a DeWalt hammer drill that I bought I think it was in 1994 uh, once again still worked fine um, but now all that stuff's cordless right you, <laughs> it's such a yeah. hassle it had a keyed chuck and uh you know, that stuff doesn't have an easy life. So, you know, inevitably you tighten it and then you couldn't get the, to loosen. You'd have to hit the key with a hammer. So it was, <laughs> it was pretty beat. And then a, um, a Porter Cable Brad nailer and 15 gauge finish nailers that I bought in the similar time frame. And this stuff all still worked. It was, it was just, uh, uh, you know, out, out, I have newer stuff that, uh, is lighter and has better performance. So, mm. but the, uh, it delighted me that this this gentleman was so happy to find this stuff. He knew uh, what he was buying. Unlike some folks that don't have really any idea what you know, when you have ten dollars on a finish nailer, what an amazing right. deal that is, or fifteen dollars on a cordless yeah. one, right? You know, like some people have yard sales because they think their junk is valuable. Some people have yard sales to get rid of stuff, right? And, I'm in the uh, latter camp the ladder, with you. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is if you shop, I don't even look for used stuff anymore because if you go to face, unless it's a yard sale, maybe, but if you go to like Facebook Marketplace or, or Craigslist or whatever, people are asking, you know, 90% of retail <laughs> for a tool that's 25 <laughs> years old. It's like, yeah, what, are you nuts? <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, too lazy to... Uh staff a uh, yard sale so when because i figure for the amount of time it would take to sit there for the amount of money you get for things i i, I, I got yeah i got three boys i donate out, on the street right now <laughs> i've got uh the old um before there were cordless electric hedge trimmers and cordless electric um weed whackers there were the kind you actually plugged into a cord if you didn't want to use a gas powered unit. And I had a couple of these sitting around in my shed at, for at least the last eight years. And they're sitting out on the street right now. I dropped them out and they'll be gone by this afternoon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think about three weeks ago, I had a whole collection of the old NICAD um, Bosch setup. I had a planer, the, the drill. I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast before drills planers, recip saw, and the batteries, you just can't get batteries. So I set them out on the street and they were gone within a couple hours. So <laughs> hopefully somebody on market, makes it. Yeah, on Facebook Marketplace for 90% retail. <laughs> yeah, that's what they're probably going to do. They're probably <laughs> going to sell them. I'm wondering if that's what this guy did when he bought all my tools. He's like, oh my yeah. God, I'm going to clean up. <laughs> uh, this comes from uh, Jim Wiley, who's the village handyman. Uh, greetings from Southern California. In podcast 567, the team talked about attaching a deck or balcony to a house. Specifically, you said that the deck ledger should be attached to the blocking between the floor joists rather than screwed into the ends of the studs. Screwing to the blocking should protect against gravity and shear loads common to decks that are attached to a house. However, the answer neglected lateral loads. Here on the West Coast, also known as earthquake country, we have to think about seismic forces. Earthquakes can produce significant lateral loads. The deck or balcony needs to be connected to the joist. This can be done with a Simpson Strong Tie DTT2Z 
deck tension tie. It connects the deck joist to the house joist. You included, included a link to an article, Eight Ways to Make an Old Deck Safe, from issue 238, written by Mike Gurton. The article included l lateral load connectors. Another example can be found in Fine Home Building issue 228, how it works. Deck loads. Apparently, considerations of lateral loads is now in the IRC. Your questioner should be encouraged always to consider lateral loads. Issues can occur anywhere. For example, high wind events such as hurricanes and tornadoes can also produce significant lateral loads. Didn't we mention this, Mike? I thought we talked about this. No, we didn't mention it. I don't, I don't recollect talking about it, but it is a good point that he brings up because a lot of times when we get a question, we focus on what the actual question is and don't go into the surrounding uh, pieces and parts that would be you need to consider, and that would be a good one is the lateral load. It, it, this is a really interesting topic, and we could do a whole after show sometime on lateral loads, where they are in the code, how they're applied, where they're important, and as Glenn, and we should bring Glenn Matthewson in as a guest host that day because there's a lot of misinformation about there and research that shows that, except if you're in seismic zones. Uh, the, whether or not a lateral load is even a connection, like a DTT2Z, is even of any value at all beyond the attachment of the ledger itself, properly attached ledger. So there's a lot there. On a completely uh, tangential note, uh, I'm going to the Fasten master, master Factory tomorrow to see how they make uh, ledger lock and other uh, Fasten Master structural screws. So super psyched about that. Jealous. Wow, I'm surprised they didn't invite me. <laughs> usually they tell me when they're going to be inviting editors up their way to Agawam. I usually tag along. I did. I just asked to, just for me, Mike. I was like, I just, just want to go up there and yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, don't invite Mike, whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know I'm selfish. Um, no, I, I, they just called me and said, like, hey, do you want to see the place? And I, I, yeah, and I'd been fishing for an invite for a year, so I'm, I'm really excited to see what's oh, going good. on there. Yeah. yeah, Andy Yangle and I went a number of years ago, and boy, it was, it was a good tour. And then yeah, getting I mean, a peek behind the curtain on all the things they're working on, all the new products. I'm going to yeah. say this just for the benefit of any manufacturer reps or manufacturer employees that uh, happen to be listening to the show is I love tours. I will go almost yeah. anywhere for <laughs> any love reason. Patrick, Patrick <laughs> loves tours. Yeah. It's even better if you include airfare. <laughs> <laughs> right. Much, much, much better. Uh, and most of them do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the R&D. It's one I find of the burdens the R &D, of the job, right? Yeah. The R&D section of those tours are really cool. I mean, it just looks like a fun job when you can see that they're, although now it's all, you know, computer modeling or not all, but it's neat when you can see the testing and the prototypes and the, it just looks like it would be fun to, to make something and see if you can wreck it. <laughs> <laughs> it's important work too. Who, yeah. who could argue that, you know, deck ledgers need to work. Uh, screws cannot shear off. They cannot pull out. This is, this is right. important stuff. So I found when I did the tour that the screw manufacturing is pretty boring. <laughs> but there's a lot of other stuff that they do there that they have a lot of other products. One that, Patrick, when you're there that I'm interested to see is ask them to see how they assemble the Icon screw joists. Because it's one of the unautomated assemblies that they do there where somebody actually has to physically assemble these open web we got to tell folks what this is first mike so it's okay. a, it's a top and bottom cord joist with the web is uh what look like giant ledger locks right connecting yep. the two cords and they're in a range that in i think an x fashion right or maybe v's yep. i don't know v's yep. yeah so it creates triangles yep much like an open web floor truss but instead of using two by fours as your those webs they're where they're using screws and they're primarily now intended for deck construction. So using pressure treated two by four for the top and bottom cords, and then those screws in between, and they, they're unfortunately only available in the Southern New England area right now, but hopefully they're gonna develop other plants. But as I understand it, they actually have to have somebody there in the factory driving these screws in at an angle, which seems like a really tedious kind of job. Yeah, so. if you ever hear me complain about my job, just remind me I could be doing <laughs> right. that for eight or nine hours a day. <laughs> yep. Uh, this comes from our friend Evan Bachwig, who's a mold assessment consultant in Texas. Good afternoon. A recent listener question was discussed regarding how to properly air seal a garage door. 
Will King of High Cotton Homes discussed a product called Thermotrax on the Build Show Network. I put a link below. It's a rather ingenious looking solution to the problem. Hope this helps that listener. So if I can briefly describe this, it like, looks like a conventional garage door track that goes on the side of the uh, folding panels, but you know, at certain points it has like indentations in it that pushes the door panels tighter to the weather strip. It looked really smart. Uh, I have not yeah. che checked out the Build Show video, but have you guys? I have not I seen that product, but there's another one out there called Green Hinge. And what it does is you take, but so Green Hinge is, if you can imagine the little hinge that hold the, the outside hinges that hold the panels together, that's got the wheel attached to those hinges. And this one has, it's like a spring load. It spring loads the wheel. So it always rides, what would it be on the interior side of the track so it's always pushing the garage door towards mm. the you know towards the weather stripping mm. so when it comes into play the advantage with this one that you described patrick uh it's it only pressurizes you know when it hits its resting point which would Instead make it of, easier to open right yeah yes, i think i would yeah. think so yeah because the other one would be riding Although, I mean, if it, it shouldn't really, I mean, if, if the door was adjusted properly, it's just riding along those uh, flanges, you know, the, the, the weather stripping flange. So it shouldn't be that big of a, I could see you getting into problems if you do it too tight and it's actually scraping against the wood and try to open. But either one, there's a lot of, I mean, if you have a shop that you, that you keep heated in the northern climate, you lose, I mean, it all Garage of your doors heat, are terrible. They all are of your just heat is going terrible, through your garage yeah. door. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, in addition, Patrick, to the track and the unique design of that with these thermo tracks is there is a companion gasket that comes in the kit. And instead of the typical just flapper that goes on the edge of the door that gives you a, a, a poor seal, this gasket is like a bulb type of gasket, which you apply to the stop so that when the track hits that high point and it pushes the wheels to push the panels against the gasket, it gives you a much better seal there. And then they have an accompanying bottom gasket that goes at the bottom of the garage door. Um, so it gets you all, all around the perimeter. They've got these extra heavy duty gaskets essentially is what it amounts to. And that's really where the sealing takes place is at the gaskets. I'm going to appeal to our listeners. If any of you have used either of these products, I think it would make a great uh, short form for our magazine spec department, which talks about building products. And this is a serious problem for airtight uh, garages. And if you're conditioning one, either air conditioning or heating it, you know, you're losing, as Mark suggests, a ton of your conditioned air out these uh, gaps around garage doors. This comes from Chris. Hi, guys. Thanks, as always, for the podcast, magazine, online content. It's awesome. I was just listening to episode 569 and the pontificating of whose job it is to install the vent fan. That really stuck a chord with me, having installed maybe hundreds at this point myself. Of all things, I'm primarily a tile installer. I didn't know the tile guy was responsible for the <laughs> bath fan, but here, here we are. Um, I do almost exclusively bathroom and kitchen remodels, and I've been doing it for 10 years now. In addition, I currently work part-time building houses with Habitat for Humanity. You guys are right to point out that a lot could go wrong with this seemingly simple job, and I can understand why some guys wouldn't want to touch the electrical or get up on a ladder or a roof to drill a vent hole. But I made a decision a while ago to broaden my building horizons and learn as much about all of the trades as I could. Partially, this came from being cheap and doing the work on my own house myself, and partially to avoid the monotony of doing the same thing every day for 20-odd years. I took the job with Habitat to expand my horizons. I never framed a house before or read a blueprint, but I learned pretty quickly. I got to pick other carpenters' brains about how to be more efficient and ask other trades on the job questions about things I was interested in learning. Three years back, I put my skills to the test rebuilding my father's burnout house. Don't worry, no one hurt and nothing too precious lost. An oil state... Oil stain soaked rags do spontaneously combust. Uh, the first thing I did was buy the current ICC code book and do a little, little light reading. The town's building inspector was really accommodating. He let me pull all of the permits myself and I did most of the work myself as well. From the electrical to the roof to sandblasting the foundation. I had a licensed electrician and plumber check my work before I potentially embarrassed myself in front of the inspector. And I knew well enough not to try doing the HVAC stuff. 
And in the end, it was a great 15-month process. I encourage any tradesperson out there to stay curious and expand your trade knowledge. And fine home building is one fine way to do it. Keep up the good work, Chris. Chris, you keep up the good work, too. That was a great email. Mm -hmm. And thanks for the uh, words of encouragement for the brand. Do you, you know, there are two kinds of tradespeople, or I'm sure there's all kinds of tradespeople, but there are folks who are really into it and folks who just are punching a clock. And, yeah. um, you know, I think it's like that in a lot of jobs, but my work with Touch a Trade has revealed um, what a monumental difference there is between the two. When I became a general contractor, I, before that, I was just, I mean, I had done lots of projects for friends and family and personal, but I, for 10 years, I was mainly just a siding contractor. And when I went off to be a GC, some of the people that I'd worked with every single day, they're like, how do you know all this stuff? It's like, dude, we've been at construction sites for, we've been at hundreds of construction sites. We've watched HVAC guys and roofers and windows. I mean, have you not paid attention at all to what they were doing? Have you not talked to somebody? And, you know, and then I read the magazines, you know, I read Fine Home Building and JLC for 20 years as, you know, as I was going. And you're right, there are some people that, you know, that I worked with for 10 years that knew how to install siding. And that was literally it. They don't, they didn't care. They didn't want to know more. So I don't, I don't know if that's a, you can teach that, but curiosity will take you a long ways. That's for sure. Yeah. And I mean, like, as he points out, doing the same thing for 20 years, who the heck wants to do that? Right. (laughs) You know, but some people like that. Yeah. Hand it to those, you know, you could, some tile setters I know, that's what they love to do. Yeah. And they're plumbers, and they're such nerds about it. Yeah. They get into the, 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 the nuances of the installation to such a detail that it excites them every day to, you know, look for a better way to do layout or something like that. So, yeah. I want the you phone know, numbers I still of think that's guys. different than someone who just <laughs> wants to set four by four tile every day in, uh, you know, hotel builds or whatever yeah, it is, right? Like yeah, that, yeah. Different. Yeah. Uh, this comes from uh, Jeremy uh, Hess, who's uh, recently on Pro Talk uh, from CNZ Construction. This company does fire restoration work. Uh, listening to Friday morning's episode was perfect timing for me. It seems like I'm constantly having this argument with the electrician and the HVAC guy about whose job it is to install the <laughs> ba- dock for the bath fan. <laughs> and you then I want to nerve, argue Mike. with. <laughs> It's funny. This is a, this is a real problem, right? And then, when, then they went to argue about what type of duct to use. Mike brought up a couple of other really good non-trade specific tasks that fall through the cracks. Definitely a good topic for a discussion for a future episode. Uh, Jeremy has project manager for CNZ Construction. Well, I guess um, Jeremy didn't listen to the after show because didn't we spend a lot of time talking about that stuff? Has it hasn't? B- believe me, I'll I'll be sure and point that out to him. <laughs> <laughs> that one hasn't aired yet. <laughs> oh, it hasn't aired yet. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I just finished it this morning. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> that was a good conversation, right? Yeah. yeah. So something yeah. to look forward to. I should remind folks, today's uh, uh, after show is about um, home ventilation, which is a topic that we've touched on a little bit, and I can't wait to talk more about that because the thinking on this has changed since I've been doing this 20-some years, and... Uh, you know, we used to not worry too much about it, but now it's a much bigger deal and we can talk about what, why that is. But I think it should be an interesting conversation. If you're not an all-access all member, I would encourage you all to sign up. You get the show and you get the access to the Fine Home Building Archive and uh, you help support the brand, which is supremely helpful. So thank you if you are. Uh, this question comes from Ted. Hey, podcast team. Thanks for all the work you do. I can't believe I listened to 569 hours and counting. <laughs> I'm trying to determine how to best install new hardy plank siding over a client's existing siding. The client's siding is one by four tongue and groove cedar installed vertically on three quarter inch continuous furring strips over two by four studs with fiberglass bat insulation. There is half inch thick fiberboard nailed to the studs like a sheathing placed between the furring strips says that there's a one quarter inch gap between the cedar planks and fiberboard. The fiberboard doesn't have any structural integrity. It seems more of like an old school WRB. We're using hardy plank on the addition, and the client is considering covering the rest of the house with the same thing. Should we put hardy directly on the cedar, put a WRB on the cedar, either self-adhered or mechanically fastened before the hardy, or something else? Thanks for all your help, Ted. Well, he asked Uh, the question for the right for the right show with both uh, siding contractor Mark and and me (laughs) on the show, so (laughs) we could tear this one apart. Yep. (laughs) 
I have a I have an opinion. Although Go for it. knowing about the subject, it usually doesn't, you know, <laughs> matter if I have an opinion or not. But I so Mike, one thing I was confused on this is he's he, the way he wrote it wrote it almost sounds like they framed the house. They put the furring strips and then they put boards in between. I'm not convinced that it seems that seems really unusual. It seems like That's they put wacky. the fiber board. That is just wacky. Yeah. It does seem and, wacky. I, I had to read it twice to understand it myself. Yeah. I'm guessing that they probably what he thinks is in between there. I'm thinking they probably sheet the whole house and then put furring strips over it. Maybe I, I don't know because, it would because change it's a only lot. a quarter inch gap. Uh, you know what I mean? So the, the say it's oh, half yeah, inch sheathing, true. right? This yeah, fiber maybe board they stuff. Well, that's a strange yeah. way to do it. Yo, I agree. It is. So but what do we do? Where, you know, he, did, did we get a clue as to where Ted is? Because sometimes there are these these processes that end up happening in a you know one you know county or something because a few contractors one guy started doing it, then somebody else said oh yeah we yeah. can do this and then it becomes the standard for you know five or ten years for a period mm -hmm. of time you know what or age? a manufacturer yeah or a certain manufacturer it has a product and they kind of put it out in the market into a local area yeah. to test it out and then all of a sudden that's what they start doing for a while and nobody else this is labor it. intensive though cutting and fitting these silly oh, yeah. things i was that's thinking wacky. about that yeah, well, maybe there were. But they might have come in like two foot panels. Say if they were yeah. two by eight, and you could put a strip, then put a panel, then put a strip, and work your way up the exterior wall. I don't know. It's right. weird. But, but I think he definitely needs a WRB, right? Because this stuff is uh, notoriously leaky. Mm -hmm. Mechanical or self adhered? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I worry about the self adhered sticking to this fiber board. I don't think that's the right material for. So, then, uh, so Patrick, by your statement, you you think the cedar's got to go. I, yeah, I think you got to integrate a you know a flashing and uh, drainage plane behind this. No, behind. Wait, but the cedar vertical TNG cedar is there, so that's over the mm -hmm. furring strips and over that. Fiber. No, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to say you put the WRB and put new flashings on top of the cedar and just like pretend like you're uh, doing a whole new siding job. Although I don't know how you deal with windows and stuff. Is that have to all be redone? We'd have to see the details because yeah. it, you know, this could be, um, you know, a, a applied window, you know, where it's uh, got a, a casing right. on it, or if it's a flange window and where that flange is in regard to that cedar T and G. So yeah, there's a lot of different. So the one, a lot of details yeah. we can't tangent yeah. into because we'll go on forever. <laughs> right. One thing to consider. So basically, if he takes off the cedar, he's going to end up with these horizontal strips. So if he if he takes out the cedar, he's limited, in my opinion, for budget and just common sense. He's limited to, to a vertical type siding. Right. Yeah, because you can't put things the same way, right? You got to right. alternate, right? Because you won't have anything unless he wants to, you know, make add furring strips over the furring strips, which is a bad idea. Because Hardy is the other thing is Hardy is, you know, the furring strips, and even if he does do vertical furring strips, I would double check to see how well they attach those because you're adding a lot of weight when you're adding hardy anything. So there's gonna be a lot more, you know, tension on those furry strips than there would be with just cedar. So what's so, your stack up siding guy? The I would probably leave the cedar and but the, the if you leave the cedar and do this a lap siding, you're oh well, see, but even a lap siding, if you're just hitting those three quarter inch uh, you know, if you're just hitting the tongue of groove, is that enough? I mean is that is is three quarter inch cedar enough to hold that hardy up i don't know i guess that would be a question for this is such a unique scenario i actually have in my notes i'd probably call the local hardy rep and see what see what they would recommend <laughs> yeah that's a great yeah. idea yeah that's a good point you know because especially actually, if, this, if you're gonna you know, hang vinyl siding i would say go ahead and slap it right over the cedar don't worry about it maybe use ring shank and and call her good and just keep in mind that there's going to be some unique flashing situations where the windows and the doors are. But with, with the weight of Hardy, I would, I personally would, wouldn't do anything without talking to the, you know, talking to the local rep probably. I think that's my answer. Put vinyl on it and get on with your life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so WRB. Yeah, for sure. And would it be a self adhering or a, um, just uh, put it right on. Put a, a, a yeah. What do you call it? Mechanically applied. I think mechanically, as long as you follow the the you know fuse cap cap nailers, and I think mechanical is fine. 
Yeah, and the cap it, are not that expensive anymore. Now, and, if you were yeah. now, if, well, yeah, because a, a self adhered wouldn't really adhere to the, you know, wouldn't really adhere like you said to the fiberboard. It would just peel right off. But those caps it's, don't hold in that fiberboard either, so you're going to obviously be nailing it at the furring strip. But if you're nailing over the cedar, then it's going to be fine. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the, uh, Ted, tell us what you do. I think we've been super helpful. <laughs> well, 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 here's another thing to, to think about too. Be, uh, uh, and again, here we are drawing a little further than just the question. Um, so WRB definitely. Okay, so what do you use for WRB? Uh, one of the advantages of a self-adhering WRB is because it can bond pretty well and cover up all the gaps. Uh, it does a good job at air sealing. And right now you've got fiberboard with gaps to the furring and there's nothing behind it. So there isn't much for an air barrier. So unless your drywall is a good air barrier, you're getting a lot of leakage through the building. So it could be an opportunity to think about using a self-adhere WRB and then figuring out a way to seal it down to the foundation at the bottom and then somewhere up at the top to the top plate of the wall so it connects to the ceiling. That might be a little bit tricky to do but you'd be able to get a little more air tightness than you would out of a mechanically applied. That'd be my only, you know, thought you might want to consider there. So uh, maybe a spray applied too might actually be something that would work with all these things, but you're going to want to talk to the respective companies about what it's designed to stick to. Cause I could see that making a huge mess and not working too. And usually with the spray applied, you have to put a, um, a bridging tape over any joints and if you got one by six t and g vertical mm. you basically a lot of tape. <laughs> yeah, might as well just cock the whole wall like just a it all. <laughs> put a mesh on the whole thing and then yeah. spray oh man so ted uh that's a good question it seems like an odd scenario let us know what you do and uh if the hardy rep has some thoughts i think that's uh worth sharing with the podcast if if uh they're helpful this comes from jake Hi, podcast team. Long-time listener, first-time emailer. I've been thinking about frost-protected shallow foundations, slabless slabs, and permanent wood foundation designs for a little while and was interested in the intersection of these unconventional assemblies. I love the discussion of episode 565 after show regarding permanent wood foundations and then watch the linked BS and Beer episode where Mike goes into more detail and shows the assembly he's considering, which uses a permanent frost-protected shallow wood foundation with a slabless slab. I... I these are too many letters for me to even like <laughs> P F P S W F. It's I won't a go permanent in. frost protected shallow wood foundation is the way he put it together. I love it. I love it. I'm going to use it. I won't go into my background or site specific context because I'd like to have a more general discussion and don't want to get bogged down in too many specifics. However, the FPSF discussion obviously applies to more northern climates, so here are my thoughts and questions, primarily directed to Mike. Have you considered using foam glass for any of these assemblies? It looks particularly promising for PWFs because it's a combination insulation slash drainage layer, so it can both keep the sheathing warm to prevent condensation from interior moisture and keep the wall dry from extreme moisture. So I should tell folks, foam glass is like uh, recycled glass that has had air blown into it so it looks a lot like blast furnace slag if you know whatever that looks like but um it's an insulation uh and uh, a free draining aggregate so uh it, it it's kind of a cool thing it's kind of hard to get so uh for what that's worth um PWF with foam glass seems to have the added benefit of significantly reducing the inward thrust on the walls because the foam glass is much lighter than native soils or typical stone gravel drainage layers and could potentially render the ladder, uh, render the lateral resistance, lateral restraint at the bottom of the walls uh, less of an issue. Similarly, I wonder if foam glass could streamline a slabless slab design. You could reproduce the rigid insulation under the slab with a thicker, compacted bed of foam glass and remove the EPS-XPS foam from the assembly entirely. I know it all comes down to availability and pricing, but it seems worth exploring. In a combination, PFP-SWF, I'm sticking with the acronym, with slabless slab, the foam glass could perform several different functions and replace multiple products. My general hesitation with slabless slabs is the same as my general hesitation with all slabs in living spaces. 
How do you design for flexibility and serviceability? I dislike the idea of burying major electrical infrastructure in the ground and beneath the slab. The plywood slab would certainly be easier to cut into than a concrete slab, but neither are, the ad are as adaptable or inspectable as a conditioned crawl space or basement. To me, designing for the long term means disentangling the structure from the infrastructure, i.e. using service cavities and allowing the interior spaces and partitions of a building to be reconfigured indefinitely without hacking into structural components or control layers. However, two layers of plywood is certainly less labor and material than a framed floor assembly and much less site work. To that end, what do you think about a design which sandwiches a service cavity between the plywood layers of a slabless slab, such as two by fours on the flat or even on edge? Constructability would be more of an issue, but let's set that aside for now because this email is already getting too long. <laughs> Alternatively, what about simply framing a two by four or two by six floor structure directly on the lens insulation layer or foam glass? With a typical subfloor layer, I, uh, he says with a typical subfloor layer, I suppose this is essentially a slab level grade a grade level deck inside would the framing have to be pressure treated it would also be above grade level and protected from moisture from below so i wouldn't think so all right so what do you guys think i'm going to stop there there's more but um i think we have the uh general question mike foam glass what do you think yeah i'm already on it jake i've been looking into it for a while and there's gravel readily available anyway in in the northeast is gravel and aero aggregates and uh yeah, a friend of mine um, used using it on the last couple houses he's built where he's done slab on grade, and um, he loves it. So I'm going to talk to him this afternoon, in fact. So he's using it in lieu of your foam board, the wing, and the, you know, for a, for a shallow foundation uh, or frost so protected? He's, he's using it under the slab. The whole slab? Underneath the entire slab because he did the cost analysis and the cost of getting EPS foam, uh, which we can get locally, and the cost of the uh, foam glass is, the, it's a wash. And really? then he figures the cost of material is a wash for the R value. And then he's filling the aggregate. He said, I'm going to have to buy, uh, you know, some crushed stone to put in as my uh, backfill on the inside anyway. So that sort of kills two birds with one stone and one step. You do need to compact it uh, in six inch to eight inch lifts as you're backfilling, so on the inside. So there is an extra bit of labor there, but anyway, it's, it, it makes sense. Um, what about the service cavity above an insulation layer or uh, a concrete slab for a slab on grade home? What do we think about this? So it's all about future proofing um, and I mean, you can go on. We, this is another good topic for an after show. Is I'm going to write that down because you're yeah. absolutely right. It is. Yeah, yeah. it is. While well, we're thinking of it. Um, because the, the, the thing with future proofing and what Jake's getting to is having access to the underside of your floor where a lot of utilities, particularly the plumbing is what it comes down to. Your plumbing ends up being below the floor level. So having access to that in a crawl space or a basement is great, but probably what a large percentage of the homes that are built in the United States today are done slab on grade, particularly in Southern climates. Um, I'm going to be doing slab on grade because of a high water table. So I can't really put in a crawl space. Uh, I don't think you're going to end up by putting that quote unquote service cavity by putting, you know, two by fours, two by sixes or two by eights down doing a sleeper sort of system over your, um, insulation layer, I don't think you're going to end up getting any advantage because you're still going to have to cut through that floor to get to that cavity. And then why not just dig out the, uh, the gravel and then um, backfill it down and, and tie your uh, vapor barrier back together with some tape if you needed to move anything. Um, it's... Hey. And people cut into concrete, you know, I agree, yeah. a slab is harder to deal with, right? But yep. you can cut into a slab and move pipes. And yeah. the electrical is not a problem. The supply right. lines are generally not a problem because they can come from overhead. Right. Uh, it's only waste lines. And you're only talking about, yeah. yeah. I it's built a, it's my, the things. So my part, my the house that I'm in, um, the mother-in-law has a crawl space, but I'm in a you know, slab on grade. And I had a uh, an outlet in my 
living room, kind of where two couches are going to meet in the middle of the room. So it was kind of in the middle of this out. Oh, in the middle of the room. Well, when I installed my wood stove, it kind of came out further than I was planning on. So this thing's in the wrong spot, basically. Anyway. And yep. it's concrete. <laughs> and guess what? It's going to stay in the wrong spot. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so so there it would be, yeah, it would, be, would it be easier to go in the basement and or crawl space and fix that? Yeah, piece of cake. But to add, to go to that length to have that advantage, it seems like a long ways to go. And, you know, we and people think uh, many times we've busted up floors in basements to move a bathroom plumbing. And, yeah, it's no fun. And it's but it's not really that it's not, you know, it's not unsurmountable by any stretch. It's it's doable. I'm going to be doing that in a couple of weeks. I'm going down to visit my father in law in Florida and we're going to redo his uh, main bedroom main bathroom uh, we did his other bath a couple years ago i'm going to be moving a toilet flange and moving the the drain for this for the um the shower yeah a couple of feet left a couple of feet right little saw cutting and you know one of the things that, but it but jake's question does get you to the thinking about if you're going to be designing a house and you start thinking about future owners which is always nice to do but you don't i mean it's your house mm -hmm. um, there's just good universal design that can be built into a house, you know, with with just your, your basic layout that it's probably going to be as useful 100 years from now as it is today. In other words, how you lay out your your bathrooms is really what it comes down to. I don't I don't see. So I guess of, what you're trying to say is if you do it right, the floor you plan, do it right the first time, yeah. people aren't going to be needing to tear it out to move stuff. And I know when I when I'm doing well, I I we can go uh, another after show is topic of, you know, read, uh, how did, when you're planning your design for your house, things to look at, to think about that get overlooked often. And I'm going to call that design gotchas. Yeah. Yep. And I know but, we've, we've are, kind of bumped you, into a okay. couple of, of podcasts. We've bumped into that topic before and, you know, good design ideas that, that can be incorporated into any house when you're designing it that will, alleviate the problem of second guessing yourself four, five, 10 years from now and thinking, oh, I shoulda, woulda, coulda. And, but you give yourself that extra flexibility. Just one example, um, in, in one of the bedrooms, we're building a closet, but we're building the closet big enough to fit a washer and dryer in. Now, why washer and dryer when I've already got a washer and dryer in another part of the house? Well, this is gonna be our house that we're gonna age out in, hopefully. And we're thinking maybe in the future that we'll need live-in care and they might want to have a stack washer dryer to their own part of the house, sort of like an apartment built onto the house. And we're going to run the plumbing to that spot so that and run, run the plumbing to it and the electric. So closet yeah. becomes a washer dryer closet in the future. I have the same thing. I had a house, uh, this slab on grade, you know, has a problem with, storage you know unlike a basement where you could throw stuff in the basement so we had designed a, a closet upstairs that was it's just a small seven by eight room maybe that was going to be storage and i thought you know this really if we had somebody for whatever reason in-law or somebody had to come and stay with us or live with us if this was a kitchenette this whole upstairs would be one entire so we ran plumb i mean it would cost almost nothing to run stub out plumbing into yeah, that that's room. it, it it, when you're doing it, it's cheap, right? It, yeah. It, it, yeah. And, it, and I, if uh, you're on a resale, it makes your house so much more valuable. Right. Yeah. Uh, I want to read one more thing Jake uh, wrote to the podcast because it's – it's very kind. So I've been a long time print and all access subscriber and have gotten so much value out of all things Taunton. So thank you all very much to those non Taunton contributors who regularly devote your time to making the podcast better. Mike and Ian, particularly your contribution is hugely appreciated. I totally agree, Jake. And uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, what a great uh, question. I love the concept of like adaptability of structures. I, 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 I think it's, um, you know, a laudable goal. I love having uh, framed assemblies so you can move partition walls anywhere. Uh, yeah. You know, 
But so even just uh, most people little... don't do that. I'm weird. <laughs> yeah, you got to think. I try to think ahead for it's like, all right, who, the next guy who has to come along and redo this, if I yeah. do it this way, it's going to be a complete nightmare for that person. Yeah. So and, you, and a lot of these little steps that you can do aren't that. I mean, it's a it's sometimes it's five, 10 minutes up front can save somebody a day and a half down the road. One of my favorite YouTube mechanics says, um, make it easy for the next guy because it's probably going to be you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So true. Yep. Uh, this comes from James. Hi, Patrick and crew. Longtime listener, first time caller. I'm a residential remodeling contractor who is moving to a new city in the Pacific Northwest from a rural area to a small city. I've looked at multiple homes in my new city and have seen more use of expansion tanks on water heaters, both electric and natural gas than I have seen in the past. In the attached picture, plumbers have installed this in expansion tank so it blocks the operation of the expansion tank, excuse me, so it blocks the operation of the cabinet door on the left. I'm wondering about changing this. I could get very clever and relocate the tank inside the cabinet or just cut off the copper and put a cap on it, omitting it. On to my question. Mike, will you please give me permission to just put a cap on the damn thing and omit the expansion tank? <laughs> It's on city water, and I don't have a lot of other info about the other plumbing in the house. The incoming line into the hot water heater is half-inch copper. Best, James. So he was m mentioning Mike Lombardi, I am sure. So I emailed Mike directly, and I heard back shortly after. Uh, Mike, I hope you're feeling better. Mike's recovering from uh, hip replacement surgery. Mm -hmm. So he was getting around okay, but he hasn't been able to work. So uh, he said also some kind things about the Taunton family. And uh, Mike, thanks for your help always. He says, uh, Patrick, please let James know I always prefer a thermal expansion tank on commercial mm -hmm. and residential water heaters. A properly charged tank should match the incoming water pressure and works best when it's connected near the cold water inlet to the heater as pictured. I like his idea of relocating the tank. If he does, he can extend the piping as needed from, to the, from the existing T. Thermal expansion tanks can extend water heater life by reducing the stress of fluctuating pressure as water temperature increases. As unlikely as it seems, even steel reinforced tanks will flex like an old fashioned bellows as pressure rises and falls. Expansion tanks will decrease this effect and will greatly reduce the potential for water hammer when a fast closing valve shuts off, like your dishwater or washing machine, for example. Water hammer can be dangerous at high pressures. There are cases when an expansion tank may not be needed. Private well water systems storage tanks can absorb excess pressure, and public water systems have some room for some expansion. But main water main and branch supply piping, check valves, pressure reducing valves, and backflow preventers can create closed systems with no room for expansion. A thermal expansion tank is a simple and effective way to overcome, overcome known or unknown conditions. Um, great answer, Mike. Thank you. Uh, sorry, James, you're not going to get dispensation from Mike the plumber. <laughs> I just, I had this issue in, when I was living in the barn dough up on the hill over here, it was, I just installed a water heater. It was, I mean, the entire plumbing system was a shower, toilet, sink, and that was it. So I installed the water heater and my last two houses never had an expansion tank. My last one was on a, um, was on a, a well. So that was able to absorb that extra pressure. But this was, and I think the size of the system matters must because this was such a small system. My, if we would take a long shower or whatever, the uh, relief pressure relief valve on the, on the water heater would start leaking. Mm -hmm. And luckily I had, it, it was sitting in a disaster pan cause it was up in kind of a rafter area. And I thought, what, you know, I, I replaced the valve. <laughs> I, did, I did mess around with it. And I asked the plumber, he goes, oh, yeah, you need expansion. You need expansion tank. Solved the problem. But, yeah, it's all those other things. I mean, it doesn't sound like a big deal. But, yeah, you can wreck your parts of your washing machine and other water, you know, water appliances. So, yeah, it's cheap insurance. And well, You're on city water, Mark. I'm, I'm surprised to learn that. <laughs> all of can, lot, It's very strange, but much of Kentucky is city water, not sewer. Mm. I mean, we have a septic, but. I think there's so much bedrock around here that the the city that I'm guessing that the municipalities just figured if we don't run water out here that nobody's it's hard to dig a well and nobody's even going to live here if, if we don't if mm. they don't have water. So, but it's nice. 
but yeah, it's, I was the first time I experienced it and that was it. I mean, the plumber just said, oh yeah, you need an expansion tank and installed one, solved, problem solved. And it's not expensive, right? Like, no, not at all. And it's super easy fix, especially with PEX, you know, if you got a PEX system, I mean, it, honestly, I, mounting it probably took <laughs> three times longer than a hooking it up. <laughs> uh, I am so grateful to our regular um, contributors who answer questions to podcast listeners. Uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful. I appreciate it greatly. And it makes for a way more useful show. Who could argue? Mm-hmm. Well, all access members, I hope you'll stay tuned for the uh, members only after show on home ventilation. And uh, all of you who are not all access members, I hope you'll consider it because it helps us keep the lights on. And uh, it's usually a pretty fun conversation. So, do you guys have anything to add? No. Nope. All right. Well, stay tuned. And uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thanks to Mike, Mark, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or view us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks.